Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Novo Nordisk Global. Hi, Alexander. How are you feeling today? Not too bad at all. Hmm, great. So you're here for your routine diabetes review. As you know, we are looking at your blood sugar. We also look at your blood pressure and your kidney function. What I can see from your test results is that your blood sugar, the HbA1c, that shows us the average blood glucose levels over the last two to three months, is a bit high. Oh no, again. Ah, it's okay, there's a lot we can do to help you. The other thing that I'm noticing today is that there's been a small but noticeable decline in your kidney health. So my sugar is still a bit high and something's wrong with my kidneys. Uh, please remind me, what do my kidneys have to do with my diabetes? Great question. Your kidneys communicate with your heart and blood vessels to help maintain a healthy blood pressure. In diabetes, having high sugar in the blood affects many things. One of the main effects is that it causes damage to the blood vessels, which stops them from working properly. High blood sugar can also damage some parts of the kidneys, particularly the tiny filters called nephrons. So when you have damage to the small blood vessels in the kidneys and to the kidneys themselves, this contributes to high blood pressure. Oh. Okay. So this is the reason for monitoring your sugar levels, kidney health, and risk factors for heart disease. This is especially important for you since you have family with a history of type two diabetes, kidney disease, and heart disease. And we want to keep you in the best possible health. Therefore, we should discuss making some changes to your diabetes care plan. But before then, do you have any questions for me? No, that was quite clear, Doctor. Well, let's look at ways we can help you manage your diabetes and improve your kidney health and blood pressure. Sounds good. Hello, I'm Johannes Mann, Professor of Medicine at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg and Director of the KFH Kidney Center in Munich, Germany. I welcome you to this program, which is entitled A Patient with Type 2 Diabetes and Chronic Kidney Disease in Clinical Practice. When we see, as physicians, patients with diabetes that also have CKD, there are three gigantic risks to these patients, namely a substantially reduced survival, a high rate of cardiovascular complications, and in the end, the risk of end-stage kidney disease. A recent study with more than 1.2 million people found out that when you have type 2 diabetes, your risk um, to die early and to have myocardial function is obviously increased, that's textbook knowledge. But what it also showed this study is that somebody with type two diabetes and CKD has at least the risk for myocardial function as somebody with type two diabetes who had already had a myocardial infarction. Also, survival is greatly reduced when CKD adds to type two diabetes. Given this high risk for mortality and for the myocardial infarction, how about the risk for the kidney? Well, in many patients 
with diabetes, the glomerular filtration rate is lost at a rate of about four, five, six milliliters per minute per year. When we are able with drugs, for instance, with inhibitors of the renin angiotensin system, but only one milliliter per minute per year less, then we can spare several years uh, on dialysis for the patients with diabetic kidney disease. Now, given these three gigantic risks, can modern glucose-lowering drugs reduce those risks? There have been large cardiovascular outcome trials, and it turned out that two of the newer drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, or GLP-1 RAs, are able to reduce the risk that we talked about, namely reduce myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular death, and also reduce, as we'll see later, the renal risk. So given those new findings, uh, there are a lot of drugs that lower uh, glucose and improve metabolic control, but there are two particular drugs which are able not only to improve metabolic control, but to reduce macrovascular complications. We've talked about your blood sugar and your kidneys. Would it be all right if we talk about your weight? <laughs> yes. Yes, I know I'm big. One of the ways we can assess weight is the body mass index, or BMI. In your case, based on your height and weight, your BMI is 34. That puts you in the obese category. Obese? Wow. Obesity is a chronic disease, just like diabetes. We don't expect you to manage it by yourself. You mean you can help me? Definitely. It's just so hard. I try to avoid sweets and fatty foods, and my children are always telling me to do exercise, but I'm working all day. I know. If you're open to it, I can refer you to a dietitian and an exercise program, so we can all start to help you improve your health. Yes, yes, please, I need help. This is brave. I'm glad. I'll put you in touch with the team today. Eating more healthily and including more physical activity in your daily life will also help with your diabetes as well as your weight. Oh, well, this is positive. I mean, it feels great knowing that we might be able to do something about my weight. Fantastic. The next thing I want to discuss is making some changes to your medication regimen. Starting to lose weight will certainly help with your blood sugar control and your kidney function and blood pressure, well, everything. But there are some medication options we should look at too. We have already talked about the evidence for cardioprotection with the modern diabetes drugs, SGLT2 inhibitors, and GLP-1 receptor agonists. What are their effects on the kidney? How do they improve kidney outcomes? A large meta-analysis data with the SGLT2 inhibitors show that there is an overwhelming effect, I might call it, of these drugs on slowing progression of kidney disease and on reducing the number of patients that arrive at dialysis. The number of patients coming to dialysis with type 2 diabetes and CKD is reduced by about a third. That's a major effect, both for the patients and also for the healthcare system. How about the GLP-1 receptor agonists? Those drugs also improve kidney outcomes. They improve particularly the urine albumin excretion rate, we do not have, however, as we have for the SGLT2 inhibitors, dedicated kidney outcome trials, but there's one such trial running right now, the FLOW trial, and we will know more about kidney outcomes with GLP-1 RAs from the FLOW trial. I shouldn't forget a new drug 
phenerenone, which is a blocker of aldosterone, but does not interfere with diabetes metabolism, but also reduces cardiac and kidney outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD. Now, how can you detect that a patient with type 2 diabetes is at kidney risk? It's very easy. You measure serum creatinine and calculate EGFR, the glomerular filtration rate, and you measure urine albumin excretion rate. Once those data are abnormal, test it again, and then you are certain whether the patient has a kidney risk and can treat this patient appropriately as we discussed today. The SLT2 inhibitors can be used in patients with diabetes down to a GFR of 25, 20 milliliters per minute. When you're using the GP1 receptor agonist, remember that those, some of those drugs are excreted by the kidney and must be adapted with the dose when kidney function is lower and in the, as a rule should not be used when GFR is less than 30. However, there are a number of drugs, mainly uh, liacrotide, um, dulaclotide, and semaclotide, which can still be used when GFR is low and have a label for use down to a GFR of 15. Those drugs are, have also the advantage that they induce a major weight loss depending on dose. And therefore, um, patients often appreciate taking these drugs to control weight at the same time as controlling their glucose metabolism and their high cardiovascular risk. You're already taking metformin and empagliflozin for your diabetes, but I think we should add another medication. Oh, why do I need to take another drug? Well, your blood sugar is not as good as we want and your kidney function is getting worse. I want to stop that. Okay, um, so what is this medication? It's called a GLP-1 receptor agonist. It works differently from the other two medications you're on to help reduce sugar levels. We also know from clinical trials that these drugs can help protect you from heart disease and stroke. Oh. Well, that sounds good. And in addition, these medications can help with weight loss. So there are many reasons why this type of medication could be of specific benefit to you. Even better. Yes, but we really do need to talk about possible side effects and how best to support you through them. Are they bad? For most people, they can be bothersome at the start, but do get better with time. Many patients experience nausea, some have vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. However, most patients find these symptoms improve quickly and there are ways we can reduce these side effects. We'll start with a low dose of the medication and increase it slowly over time. Uh, okay, uh, will you help me with that? Yes. The other very important thing is to eat the right foods. <laughs> Oh no, I still need to improve my diet. <laughs> Definitely. And this is a great opportunity to help you take those first positive steps. Your diet is also important for your kidneys and of course your diabetes. I will make you an appointment to see the specialist dietitian. We also need to get you moving. Your children are right, you need to include more exercise in your day. Okay. I know this is important. The other thing to discuss is that most GLP-1 receptor agonists are given by injection. An injection, like uh, insulin? Mm, these drugs are quite different from insulin. They are injected with a device that has a tiny, thin needle. Most patients say they barely feel it going in. Most of the GLP-1 receptor agonists are only injected once a week. And importantly, Unlike with insulin, there is no risk of hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, when they are used correctly. Okay, well that sounds reassuring. I really want to get on top of my health.
You aren't doing this alone, Alexander. Your specialist diabetes nurse, dietitian, pharmacist, and I can help you learn to use this new medication, improve your diet, and support with your weight loss goals too. Great. Well, I look forward to continuing working with you on improving my health. Thank you. My pleasure. Let's meet again in one month to see how you are and whether we can start to increase the dose of the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Thank you, Doctor. See you soon. Now, we heard a lot about diabetes and chronic kidney disease and how we can address those problems. Recently, the American Diabetes Association and an international group of nephrologists, the KD Association, uh, published a guideline on how to treat these patients, which emphasizes that we should, when we're using medication, start right away with metformin and an SGLT2 inhibitor. And when this is not enough, the next drug should be a GB1 receptor agonist. Uh, it is also clear from these guidelines that we should address physical activity, diet, and so forth, and need absolutely a multidisciplinary team to care for those multifaceted patients. How about the diet? Is this not important anymore? Well, it is still very important, particularly in patients with diabetes and CKD. Those patients should adhere to a reasonable diet and should be instructed about the diet by a multidisciplinary team that knows about nutrition, knows about the kidneys, knows about metabolism and also the cardiovascular problems of these patients. So it, it, it's not up to one person, but to a multidisciplinary team that should address those patients. As I told you, there are two drugs that are very important for those patients, the SGLT2 inhibitors, which have as a major side effects um, uh, genital infections, and therefore you have to teach the patients about preventing um, genital infections. The GLP-1 receptor agonists have some gastrointestinal side effects that you should tell your patients beforehand. So induce some nausea, uh, and maybe some diarrhea, it's important when we are using those drugs to use them at a low dose initially and slowly increase the dose. So go low and go slow. If you adhere to this um, recommendation, the vast majority of the patients will adhere to the treatment because of the benefits, because also he notices that he is losing weight when taking those drugs. It is also important to educate the patients when he takes the drugs related to, to uh, the nutrition, to when he is eating, and you should tell the patient when he takes the drugs that at that time he should probably not take a huge meal at the same time. With those recommendations in mind, you can slowly titrate your drug, avoid many of the side effects, and for instance, uh, avoid that the patient stops taking the drug. Where do we stand now with the kidney function of Alexander? What you're seeing on this slide is a heat map that is, that is frequently used by nephrologists. It shows on the one hand, the decreasing kidney function. So GFR uh, and on the one hand, and on the, on the other hand, the increasing rate of urine albumin excretion. So let's assume uh, Alexander has a GFR of 63. This puts him in the category G2 for the GFR, which is the GFR between 60 and 89, and his urine excretion rate is 288 milligrams per gram. This puts him into the bracket of 
A2 for aerobic excretion rate. So his CKD stage is G2, A2, and that um, has the color yellow here. Intermediate risk, he could be at a much higher risk if his GFR is lower, then the whole picture began, becomes orange or red, so then he's at a very high risk, both for a cardiac attack and also for dialysis. That's what these the colors tell us. So it's useful to use this heat map when you categorize your patients and can tell him where his risk is and what can be done about it. Now we have discussed some of the evidence for cardio protection with the modern diabetes drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and have seen how these drugs also offer kidney protection. We have looked at implementing the latest guidelines, and we have seen in Alexander's case how GLP-1 receptor agonists might help to improve glucose control, provide kidney protection, and also help this patient in weight management. Thank you for participating in this activity.